The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, the Lord appointed 72 others whom he sent ahead of him in pairs to every town and place he intended to visit. He said to them, the harvest is abundant, but the labors are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out labors for his harvest. Go on your way. Behold, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Carry no money bag, no sack, no sandals, and greet no one along the way. Into whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this household. If a peaceful person lives there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Stay in the same house and eat and drink what is offered to you, for the laborer deserves his payment. Do not move about from one house to another. Whatever town you enter and they welcome you, eat what is set before you, cure the sick in it, and say to them, the kingdom of God is at hand for you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Everybody saw you walk in. Where are you from? The, say that again. Say Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Yeah. <laughs> Down here it's Rhode Island. <laughs> no, I just wanted to make sure you felt welcome. You're here for the soccer tournament. We had some other people here this morning from Rhode Island, from Boston. You all know where Boston is, don't you? Boston spelled B-O-S-T-O-N. Down here they say Boston. Boston. So, good to have you. Thank you so much for being with us. Some of you know a number of years ago, uh, before I entered the seminary, I had worked many different types of jobs. Um, couldn't find a whole lot I was satisfied with. And one of the jobs I took was being a salesman for the Hormel Meat Company. Now, probably just about everybody here has had exposure to Hormel if you've ever eaten Spam, though I was responsible for selling their fresh meat products. And I'll never forget, uh, went through a month's worth of training on how to be a salesman and all that, and then the boss that I had, who was a semi-retired Hormel super salesman, had been for years, and uh, felt that I, I could do this thing, it assigned me to Kanoa County. I had Kanoa County and a little piece of Putnam County, that was my territory, and I was supposed to go and open up a Hormel business in those areas. So there I went driving from Logan. Logan's about two hours southwest of here, just so you all know. And it's out in the country for sure. So first day of work, brand new blue pinstripe suit. You know, I was looking the part, you know what I'm saying? And I had a little briefcase with my sales book in it, and I head off to Charleston. And the first place I was told to stop was a little fast check store in, at the edge of uh, Kanoa City. And I remember walking into the store that morning early and uh, was looking around. I wanted to know who the meat buyer was for the store. And, and they said, well, he's back in there in the coffee room. I said, well, could you drink in the coffee room? So I went back in the coffee room and standing around this coffee pot are several men uh, and another guy who was obviously an employee of the store. And um, I came very quickly to realize that they were my competitors. And what was amazing was I was a little puppy compared to these dinosaurs. These guys were in their mid-50s, mid-60s. Here I am, 24 years old. And I'll never forget the guy from the armor company. He had silver hair. And he took one look at me, took a sip on his coffee, and he looked down and he looked up and he went, <laughs> like that. And I knew I was in trouble. Well, I really got in trouble when I went to introduce my premier product, they sent me to sell and to introduce to Kanoa County the Hormel Cure 81 ham. Has anyone ever eaten a Hormel Cure 81 ham? Okay, I think it's still the best ham on the market. 
But at any rate, I remember going and I'm talking to this guy and telling him about this Hormel ham and how wonderful it is and all that. And, and he said, well, what's it going to cost me? And I said, well, I'm going to make you a special price. We've got a deal going on here. It's a buck eighty-nine a pound, your cost. And he looked at me and started laughing. And I said, what's going on? And he literally grabbed me by the, by the jacket and took me out to the meat case. And here are all these hams, but the one he showed me was a superior ham, the superior meat company ham. He was selling it for 89 cents a pound, which meant it cost him less than 89 cents a pound. The ham I was selling him was a buck 89 his cost. The suggested retail was 2.29 a pound. So you see why he laughed at me. Well, that wasn't the first place. Everywhere I went that week, people fussed, cussed, laughed. They didn't want it. They didn't want to hear a word I had to say. And so at the end of the week, I went back on a Friday. My boss, Mike Spadafora, a nice old Italian guy, he looked at me and he said, Jim, my boy, how did it go this week? I said, I hate this job. What's wrong? And I said, nobody wants its stuff. It costs too much. Yeah, but you got to sell quality, not price. You don't want to get down on the ground with all those other people. You sell quality. You got the best product. And I said, yeah, well, guess what? The dogs ain't eating it. And so he said to me, get back out there and you start again next week. And you go and you go to every place and you tell them you got quality. And I did. And I got beat up the second week. So finally, at the end of the week, he said, oh, well, how'd you do it? I said, Mike, I hate my job. I don't want to do this anymore. And he said, have you ever tasted a Cure 81 ham? I said, no. He said, well, you go down in the meat shop. And he said, you tell Roy. Roy was the head meat cutter for our little area there. And he said, you tell him to shave you some Cure 81 ham and you make a sandwich. And so I went down there, and he shaved this Cure 81 ham. There was some bread laying around. There's always laying bread around, bread laying around a meat shop. And I put some on a sandwich, and I took a bite, and my tongue started to dance. It was happy. It was delicious. And the thinner it was shaved, the better. And so my boss says to me, you go out there starting on Monday and you go out and you make ham sandwiches and you pass them around all over Kanoa County. And I thought, that's interesting. So I did. There was a nice little Italian bakery, it's out of business now, in Charleston. And I went there and I got some fresh Italian bread. You know what I'm talking about? A little crusty on the outside. And so I went to all these stores, I'm making ham sandwiches and passing them out. By the end of three months, my first quarter, I had shipped my first boxcar of hams to Kanoa County. 20,000 pounds of ham. It was amazing. But you know what? I could not sell a Cure 81 ham until I believed it was the best item on the market. You see, Lanny's shaking her head over there. She knows she's in sales. Until you love what you're selling, you're never going to make it. And you know what? Somebody commented one time, after all these years, Father Jim, you're still in sales. And I guess I am. And that brings us to our gospel today, a passage that's a follow-up to the gospel last week. In last week's gospel, remember in Luke chapter 9, 51, Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. He was going from the north in Galilee to Jerusalem, the south, and he sent the 12 apostles ahead of him. The first thing that happened, rejection. They weren't allowed to enter a Samaritan village. You remember the cute little detail where James and John come to Jesus and they say, let's fry these Samaritans. Let's nuke them. Let's call down fire from heaven. And you remember Jesus didn't say anything. He just kind of gave them this <clears throat> look. And they went on. Well, now Jesus sends out, we're told, a further 72, or 70. And the reason I say that, two very important ancient manuscripts have different numbers. So some of you go home to your Bible, it's going to say he sent out 70 disciples. Some of you go to your Bible, it's going to say 72. 70 or 72, what's important is the symbolic nature of the number. 
For Luke, it means everybody. It's a way of saying the world is meant to receive the good news. Jesus tells them, you're going to go out, and he said, it's like going out to an orchard where all the trees are so full of fruit, they're almost bending over. They're so full of wonderful fruit, and the fruit is so ripe, it's almost at the point of rotting. So you've got to get out there because the harvest is rich. You've got to pick the fruit. There's no time to waste, says Jesus. And then he says, when you go out, he gives them some interesting instructions. He says, take no extra pair of sandals. Don't take a traveling bag bag with extra clothes. Wear only the clothes you have on your body and no money with you. You know, when I was coming back yesterday from Wheeling after having done a, a wedding on 70 and 77, both of those interstates, all you could see was vans and cars filled with, with luggage and all that kind of stuff. And those vans with those carriers on top, huge, people carrying a lot of stuff. We couldn't do that when we were traveling today. Jesus says, only the bare minimum. Why? It's a way of saying your Father is going to provide for what you need. You do the basics, He'll take care of the rest. Did it work? If you fast forward the Gospel of Luke to chapter 22, verse 35, the Last Supper scene, only in Luke's Gospel, Jesus turns to the disciples and says, do you remember when I sent you out without extra sandals, without extra clothes and no money? Do you remember that? And they say, yeah. And He said, did you want for anything? And they say, no, we did. Everything was taken care of. God took care of their needs. All they had to do was preach. Jesus tells them, you're going out as lambs among wolves. And he also lets them know that rejection is a definite possibility. But he says, when that happens, when you announce the good news and people reject you, go to the edge of that town, take those sandals off your feet, Pound them, shake every piece of dust off of them and let them know it's going to be rough because you chose to reject the kingdom of God. What's the whole idea of shaking the dust off your feet? Well, we all probably remember when we went into Baghdad several years ago. Do you remember when they toppled the statue of Saddam Hussein? Do you remember what the people did? They took their shoes and beat the statue. It's repugnant to touch the shoes or the feet that are dirty in Middle Eastern culture. The bottom line, Jesus is offering life to those who will listen. If you don't, then you must deal with the consequences. Now, what's this passage have to say to us? It's a tough one in terms of application because we Catholics, you see, don't like this idea of witnessing to Jesus. We don't like that. You know, it conjures up those images of the Jehovah's Witnesses riding in pairs on bicycles down our roads, back and forth, wearing those black suits with ties and, and carrying their Bibles. Uh, we look at that and, and may, we may say, wow, I could never do that. I mean, they actually do that down here. They won't do it in Stanton Island, but they do it here. They ride around everywhere witnessing to their faith. You know, we look at that and like I say, we'll say, wow, they're awesome. That's incredible. But we would never do that, you see. Um, faith tends to be a very private thing for Catholics. We don't like to talk about our faith, you see. But then there's another problem. And a lot of priests and a number of bishops have this mentality and it's ancient thinking and it doesn't work. The old thinking was open the doors wide and they'll come in. Guess what? That won't happen anymore. If I open the doors wide out here on Norway and expect people to come in, I'll get a few, but I'll get a bunch of houseflies and mosquitoes coming in more often. We are competing, my brothers and sisters, with ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, Hollywood, the media, MTV, the occult, New Age philosophies. It's all out there. And the most popular one is materialism. We are competing for people's attention. So what are we supposed to do? 
Are we supposed to witness or do we each just keep privately practicing our faith? You know what? That's not a solution. Because when you die and you die and you die and I die and we all die, that's the end of the Catholic faith, huh? Somebody's got to preach. And you can't depend upon an old priest to do it all. So what do we do? This coming fall, we're going to be doing something that no other school in this state will be doing. Our grade school is going to offer electives. It's unheard of. And one of the electives we're going to be offering to our middle school students is speech, public speaking. I'll be teaching that class. One of the things I'm going to teach them, the most important point about public speaking, and this will amaze you, the most important thing about public speaking, the first thing that you must have nailed down, know your audience. You have to know your audience. You know, if I get up and I give this theological dissertation to a group of eight-year-olds, guess what's going to happen? They're going to be staring at the space. You think Neil Wiggles, wait till you see a bunch of eight-year-olds listening to me talk about Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica. Ain't going to work. So how do we get to know our audience? How do we get to know, Lanny, our marketing community? There was a study done about 15 years ago, which data is still very valid. It was done by the University of Notre Dame, the Irish. Go Irish. They asked a number of questions to Catholics all across the country. One of the most important questions that they asked was, what keeps you coming back to church regularly? The three top vote getters, are you ready for this? Number one, good preaching. Good preaching. Now, one of the first things I did when I came here was get rid of our antiquated sound system. I'd be up there speaking after mass greeting people and they'd say, what'd you say? Huh? What, what did he say? I can see people back there looking at one. Huh? What did he say? You know, something as simple as that. The content, well, you're going to have to be the judge. I try to stay on top of my work. But the point is, people want to hear a good, solid, challenging, but relevant message. Secondly, good music. Good music. And that's one thing we've done here since I've been here. We have upgraded radically our music ministry. But there's room for more. Do you have a good voice? C.D. Carney after Mass. Are you having, do you have an ability, a talent in playing a musical instrument? C.D. Carney after Mass. Where's D? Raise your hand, D. She'd be happy to get you involved. But thirdly, and this may surprise you, hospitality. Hospitality. You see, in the Catholic Church, we identify hospitality with ushers passing out bulletins. That's hospitality. And they do a wonderful job in passing out bulletins. But is that it? Is that all we're going to do? The most hospitable experience I ever had in the Catholic Church was in a church on the eastern side of Nashville, Tennessee. I never experienced being more welcome in a Catholic Church. They had it down pat. So how do I become hospitable? How do I do hospitality? Can you welcome me into your home as a guest? That's a good starting point. How would you welcome me into your home as a guest? Well, first of all, you're going to invite me, huh? Are we getting the word out of invitation? Secondly, when I come in, you're going to be glad to see me, I hope. When you come into your house, you're going to show me perhaps your house. Look at these rooms. This is where my husband studies. This is where we do this, we do that. Uh, the bathrooms, by the way, are over here, Father Jim, or the bathrooms are over here. Very important information, and what's going to happen in time, you're going to begin to tell me the story about your house. Did you own this house originally? Was it one you inherited from your family? What's the history behind this house? What's the tradition? 
from where did you come? Staten Island, Chicago, St. Louis, and you built this house, or you bought this house on the open market? You know, you're going to tell me those things. What's going to happen? You're going to make me feel like I know you, like I know your story. And that's going to make a huge difference in how I feel. Well, if you can welcome somebody to your home, why not learn how to welcome your parish home? This is the most important home you'll ever have if you believe in eternal life. But there's another thing that wasn't included in the Notre Dame study that I learned from my spiritual director years ago. She was Immaculate Heart of Mary's sister with a double PhD, one in biology and one in psychology. And not too long before I left the seminary, she said, Jim, there's something I want you to remember. People are hungering for an experiential relationship with the Lord. Translated into common talk, people are wanting to feel and enjoy their faith. They want to feel their faith and enjoy it, and regularly so. So how do you do that? How do you get people to experience their faith? It's easier than what you would ever think. I'm going to go back to one of my favorite images, food. This time of the year in Cabell County, probably something you won't see up in Rhode Island, we have a lot of fresh produce that's coming in. Uh, roadside stands with all kinds of different fresh vegetables and fruits. It's wonderful. It's a delicious experience living in Cabell County. But you know what? One of the things I fell in love with my first year here was sweet corn. Sweet corn. How many of you like sweet corn? Yeah. You don't get it like that up in Wheeling. And I did some study. There's actually a process in corn. It starts out right now, the first corn has just come out on the market. It's, it's kind of a generic type of corn. It's a sweet corn. It's okay, but, but, but there's better to come. Within a week or two, we're going to have what's called peaches and cream corn. Another name for it is bicolor corn. It's white and yellow. It actually, the yellow has a, a peachy looking color to it. It's much more sweet than the corn that's out right now. But my favorite, my to kill for corn, is silver queen. Oh, baby. I had not had Silver Queen corn in years until I came here and found some out on an open market. And I never want a cardiologist to hear me say this, but I love to have a little corn with my butter, if you know what I mean. Well, I got some. The problem was I only got one dose of it the first year. It was gone. By the time I discovered it, it was gone. And so, not to be deterred, I decided to do my Silver Queen research. And so I started looking and talking to people. What can you tell me about Silver Queen corn? And, and, and what I found out was the name Gillette. Gillette. Everybody kept saying, Mr. Gillette. He's the king of Silver Queen. Mr. Gillette. And I said, who is this creature? They said, oh, he lives somewhere over in Proctorville. You, you, you got to go see him. He's a really nice guy, and he has, he's the largest grower of Silver Queen corn. And so like a bloodhound, I went in search of Mr. Gillette. One of my tips was that he sometimes hangs out at Fairland Middle School out on the school lot selling his corn. I went the first time, couldn't find him. But the second time, I went up to the middle school property and lo and behold, there was a man with white hair sitting in a lawn chair with an old beat up pickup truck and the bed of the truck was filled with corn. I said, I got my man. I went over, I parked and I introduced myself and thanks be to God, he said, I'm Mr. Gillette. I didn't know whether to genuflect before him or fall down prostate before him. I remember calling him the king, the king. And you know what? He was a beautifully faith-filled, loving man. And he told me about Silver Queen. 
He told me some things that most people have no clue about how it changes. The, the problem with Silver Queen corn, you have to eat it within the first 24 hours that you cut it because the sugars are so high in the corn kernels, they transform very quickly into other parts. And so you gotta eat it quickly. But the thing he taught me was how to put up silver corn for the winter in a freezer. He taught me a secret and a recipe, which I'll share with you. But you know what? I forgot that I had some back in the freezer one time, and it was in that freezer for two years. And when I thawed it out, it was as fresh tasting as it was the day I put it in because of one little trick that he taught me. But my point is this, how many of you feel the urge to eat Silver Queen corn right now? <laughs> yeah, well guess what, you're probably not going to find it on Sunday. But your mouth's watering, my mouth's watering, and I'm not going to have any Silver Queen today. My point is, if I can share my experience of Silver Queen corn with you, can I witness to you about my faith? That's the whole idea. What does your faith mean to you? Do you enjoy your faith, or is it just something you go through the hoops to practice? You wouldn't be here week after week if you didn't enjoy your faith. But the question is, are you willing to share it? It's hard sometimes to get over the hump, but if you love what you believe and you enjoy it, then you will. So my brothers and sisters, the Lord sends us out to be his disciples. Whether you live in Rhode Island, St. Louis, Chicago, it doesn't matter. We are all called to be witnesses to the Lord. Let's pray that we may hear this call that we may heed this call and that we may have the generosity in our hearts to share with others what the Lord Jesus means to us.